the place. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, but let's worship God together. Let's sing songs of praise to Him. Let Him, uh, let His, let the joys uh, rejoice today. Let your joy be resounding in this place. Um, let God just speak to you as we praise His songs and sing of His goodness and of His love and His grace. Lord God, I pray right now that you would just pour out your love and your presence over us, Lord Jesus, that your, everything that we do would be in line with your truth and your goodness, and I pray, Lord God, that you would just take us past ourselves and into the glorious wonder of knowing you and being in your presence, Lord. Every day, Lord God, grow us closer to you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Stop forgetting my 
just do this moment but as you walk through your day, praise God in right now. Lift up our troops, lift up our loved ones. 
God, as we come forth into you to give back to you what you blessed us with in Jesus' name. today, but I do want to bring it to the fact that if you got a, uh, a bulletin, um, in there is a list of the uh, upcoming events. So you can take that and put it on your refrigerator or whatever you want to do. But also in the bulletin uh, that I want to bring to everybody's attention is the prayer of people who need prayer. And so you can take that and put it on your refrigerator and lay your hand on that and pray for these people throughout the week. There's a lot of information in the bulletin, so... I just want to make sure you know that it's there. So, what's happening the rest of November? It's exciting. It is so exciting. November, well, first off, I'm going to say that there's going to be no women's meeting this month. We're just really too busy. So, we're going to pick up back in December, and I want to invite all the women to come um, and partake. Um, the men had a wonderful time last Thursday, so let's uh, meet as women, too. November 23rd, the church... Uh, Kimberly is leading this. This God placed this on her heart that nobody should eat alone on Thanksgiving. Nobody should be in their house by themselves with no family or maybe no food. So Kimberly has is, is, uh, moved forward on what God has um, told her. Pastors generously opened the church. So November 23rd, yes, Thanksgiving from 11 to 2. If you know of anybody who uh, is eating alone and maybe don't feel comfortable coming to your house with um, all your family, then please invite them to the church. We're having traditional food. Um, we're having Thanksgiving turkey and ham and all the sides. And I was, um, I'm just going to say, Kim, that there was a lady that came, knocked on my door, and at, told me, she said, I want to support y'all's outreach for these people. Can you take this? And she gave us a donation, and I gave it to Kim today. And this was just, this is not a person of our church. This is a person in the community. And that was such a blessing. So that's November 23rd, if you know anybody. Even if it's a family who doesn't have food for Thanksgiving. I know the elementary school, and I'll get to that in a minute, feeds one day. It's coming up soon. But this is on Thanksgiving Day. So if there's anybody which you know of that this will bless, please let them know. The name uh, of who they call is in the bulletin. November 26th is our luncheon here in honor of our soon-to-be pastor's wife. We're so excited. Her name is Katie Cannon, and she will be visiting in just eight short days, from what I understand from pastor this morning. It's not like he's counting it or anything. So we're having a luncheon to honor her on November 26th. So bring your best dish. Let's show her how much we love her, her fiancé and how much we're going to love her. Now, and also on the 26th is our first children's practice. We are going to have a children's program because we're stepping out in faith. We all might have three or four now, but we're having a children's program. So if you have a child or a grandchild, um, let, please let them be a part of it. We're going to practice after church. You don't have to bring them back another time. Um, so they're going to practice right after church. Now, the 26th is a little different because we're going to have the luncheon and the practice, but it'll all work out. Um, community Thanksgiving, like I just spoke about, is November 19th at the elementary school. It is free. You want to come eat Thanksgiving dinner. You didn't want to cook it, but, you know, you can go over there to the elementary school and get some really good food. So I believe that is all the announcements that I have. So I'm going to turn this back over to Pasta. Okay, all right, well, there we are. Um, uh, so we're going to do our communion real quick. So if uh, we're going to start passing out the communion cups and bread, and I just want to uh, invite you guys all in. We're going to do this all together. If you are a member of the body of Christ, we practice open uh, communion here at this church. Some churches do not do that. So, um, but not to call them out, but I'm just letting you know. <laughs> um, but we practice it open, and we do so because you are part of God. If you believe in God, if you follow Christ, uh, we have our door wide open for you to join us in communion this morning. Yeah. I hope that God blesses you throughout the process of it all. 
As we know in the scripture, Christ was preparing to die on the cross and um, decided to bring in his, to meet up with his 12 and they meet up in a little room and they prayed and had fellowship together. Yes. It was a communal thing, a, a group of them together celebrating that moment. And um, that's when we get to what we talk about today with our, uh, our communion. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, starting verse 23, For I received you from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take on this, we think of the body of Christ, think of the beating and the struggle uh, on the cross, the process of the suffering that took place for our atonement, for our connect, reconnection, restoration, back to Christ, back to God. And we like to think about this because it's super important for our faith to step forward in that. So I want you guys to uh, uh, all uh, make sure that you're getting your little cup. Everybody's gotten everything so far. I need one, so somebody was freaking up here. Uh, once we get that all passed out, we're gonna we're gonna uh, pray for the body and for the for the juice. <laughs> so I want you to hold up your little bread. Everybody have one now, a little cracker. Hold it up and pray over it with me. Lord, we pray right now that He would just anoint, Lord God, this moment. Lord, I pray that this representation of the body and suffering He did to die and take away our sins, Lord Jesus. When we remember it in our hearts, when we think of you every day, Lord God, for all the beautiful and wonderful things you've done throughout our lives and faith, Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, we know without a shadow of a doubt that none of that would be able to be true without your sacrifice on the cross, and we believe today, Lord God, that you are transforming us, that you're making us whole in you by the power of your Spirit, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, we also, in the same way, also he took this cup. And after the supper, saying, "This cup is a new covenant in the blood. This is as do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me." Okay. I had a professor in college that um, made sure to, to remind us that it says after 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 they had eaten after the supper. Um, we, we try to rush these things together because we don't have a lot of time. But, but uh, it's important for us when we take communion to, to realize that there was a ton of fellowship in between those two elements. And a lot of uh, conversation and joy and, and gathering together. So we take part in that. In, in that joy of joining with Christ, or joining with the disciples as they remember Christ. Uh, and, and continue to do so after his death as they thought of him in this moment, not knowing what was going to be the outcome. They prayed and believed and trusted in God. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to remember the beautiful thing that God did for us on the cross. A wonderful moment of grace for us. So I'm going to pray over this. Lord, I got to pray that you would just let this juice, Lord God, this cup, Lord, let it be anointed by your will and your way, Lord Jesus, that as we think of the blood that you shed on the cross, that we would know without any doubt, Lord God, of the safety we are in in your presence, Lord God, that our faith is secure by you because you did this for us, that you transformed us, even in our worst of moments. And even in our worst of moments to come, Lord God, I pray, Lord, we know that, the, that we can trust in you, we can have faith that you're going to bring us through, that you're going to take us through the process. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's take this cup together. Amen. Okay, amen. Okay, we have one more thing we have to do before we, well, actually we have a couple of things, but I need to get all the little ones Yay, up here because we got our BGMC and um, here, I'm going to get my own little bag over here. I guess you guys are going to take it up. Take over there, Miss Karen. 
All right. So I want you guys to get all your little change out. We have four beautiful, Thank wonderful, you. handsome yes. uh, young kids here yes. that are I hear. And guess what? This little one right here, Dean, yes. is your four? Five. You're five? You just turned five today. Yes. So make sure to give them a few Happy extra birthday. quarters, a few more dollars, uh, whatever you got. Just make sure to give it out. <laughs> Say happy birthday as you hand it over yes. to Dean. There you go. There you go. Over around. Over around. Grab the other side. Everybody. There you go. Happy birthday, Dean. Remember, BGFC money goes not to the kids, though we want, might want it to. <laughs> the smiles. But we're giving these to help kids uh, have tracks and things all over the mission field, all over the world. Uh, it's an opportunity for kids to join in missions. And what a blessing that is. Yes. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. We got somebody over here, you guys. You gotta, you gotta work your way around. has to give his own little prayer and blessing. I want all the veterans to stand up for me. If you served in the military, I know there's a few here. Um, yes. Uh, we want to thank you for your service on this Veterans Day. It's a beautiful American holiday. We recognize those that served in, in, in war. I, I, I'm past my time to be able to. I, I miss, miss my opportunity. I, miss, it's like, I had like, you know... 20 years, or 18 years to do it, but uh, went into ministry. But I, I, uh, I'm so thankful for all of our military. I, I had both uh, um, my both grandparents also. My grandfather served in the Korean War, and um, I had a great grandfather that was in, a great great uncle that was in World War II and veteran. Um, and uh, we're thankful for all those that serve. That God uh, has given, brought you back. We know it's always tough thinking of all those that were lost along the way, and we, we pray a special peace on your hearts today. Um, so, Lord God, we pray an anointing, Lord God, on all those that have served, not just the ones here, but everywhere. Lord, we pray that you would just uh, give them peace of mind, Lord God, that you would just take away any, um, any darkness that might try to take a hold of them, Lord, and you would just bring release your spirit of joy and, and thanksgiving on their life, Lord God. I pray that you would just anoint all those, Lord God, that have served, Lord God, that they would walk in freedom and, and know, Lord God, that they have uh, succeeded in their mission and that they can continue to succeed in your in your calling on their lives, Lord God. I pray that you pour out your spirit over us today. In your name, amen. 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 Wow. <laughs> There's joy in the house of the Lord. I wanted to do a Oh yes, uh, yes. All the kids that are still in here, yes. Please, please take your have your chance to go back. We have uh, Lisa's back there is going to take you, and we're going to have a little class for our kids. We, I'm sorry, we have a lot going on today. Yeah, we, we do. do. Uh, it kind of stacked up on us. <laughs> uh, but I want to uh, thank you again for being here. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Can you feel it today? Yes, yes. God is here. There is joy. 
Let this joy be complete in your heart. Let the troubles of this week just fall away. Let God just transform your life. Right? Freedom from sin and shame is not in the house. Or sorry, freedom in from sin and shame is in the house. Sin and shame is not in the house. Not in the house. Right? Hope for life's burden being, are being lifted. Joy is here. It's complete. It's overwhelming. We read Psalms 5, 11, it says, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread the protection over them, and that those who love you, your name may exalt you. In Psalms 25, 20, verse 5, it says, May we shout for joy over, our, over your salvation. In the name of God, set up your banners. And Psalms 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. O righteous, shout for joy. All you, you upright in heart. When we walk in Christ, right, the devil will not bring us down. Right. Even in our worst of places, he can't destroy us because Christ is there. There's nothing that we could ever lack, nothing we can lack for the battle. He's God, Christ has already won the victory for our lives. He's already transformed us. This is a time of joy that does not end. And I wanted to sing, uh, you know, Sometimes when I'm picking out the song list uh, for the worship team on some days, I, I, I think about it a little bit, but not all the time. <laughs> like, I just think about it. It's like, oh, I'll do this theme, this theme. And I, like, it's like I have that on my right side of my brain and on the left side of my brain. I don't know if that's really how it works, but I, 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 I'm preparing my message, and sometimes those things line up. <laughs> I, had a, I wanted to sing that song, House of the Lord, this week. It just kind of came to me, but also I have a scripture that feels like <laughs> it's about the same thing. When I, when I was a teenager, I told you this story before, but I should have died, right? I was in Equatorial Guinea, Africa, on a mission trip with my parents. My nose started to bleed, and, and I couldn't control it. It was pouring out like a faucet. Nothing I could do to stop it. I had, uh, it was not, it was, there was no end to it, right? I had... I had known there was a stoppage in my nose for several months, but I didn't know what it was. And then when it started bleeding, I started to realize it was something dangerous. It turns out there was a group of blood vessels up in there that were joined together into a tumor, and they had ruptured, and they were just pouring blood straight out of my heart, right? Yeah. Onto, you know, the sink in front of me. Later on, I would find out from the doctors that I shouldn't have been able to stop it because they were way up in my nose. Like, I couldn't, like, pressure. Like, it was up in there. <laughs> I shouldn't, it shouldn't have stopped. But I learned something when I was young, how to worship God, how to praise Him through the trial and the, and the struggle, how to live in joy. And in that moment, I, I sang out the song that was saying, My Father God. It was in this pidgin English. It said, You're my papa, oh... I don't even know really what that means, <laughs> but uh, just that God is my Father, Creator. I started singing out praise to Him, and I knew God had pulled me out of that struggle. And even though though I didn't, I was too naive at the moment. I asked God to to stop that blood. I didn't know that that was an impossibility that the doctors would say it shouldn't have stopped, but I it did. And in God, I rejoiced. That's what we do. We, we give joy to God. We, we love His presence. Can you rejoice in the Lord today? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you? Are you excited about His presence? Yes. Yeah. Are you excited even in the trial, even in the struggle, even in the hardship? Is He not worthy of our praise? Yes, He is. Right? Let me tell you uh, that He is and always will be. Because he exists both before us and after us, and yet still saves all of us, all of those who believe and trust in Christ. He saves us. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise and adoration. He is worthy of our service to him, for he came into this world to transform us into righteousness and is doing it again and again and again. He's transforming all that believe and trust in him. So that gets us to start our scripture today. And I'm starting out of James 1. Verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to verse 11, so there's lots of ones in this one. <laughs> See what is there? Lots of ones in this one. Uh, so it says this, James 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the 12 tribes in the dispersion, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and in the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower on the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises in the scorching heat, and withers the grass, its flowers fall, and the beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would just anoint us for today by your Spirit. Let your love shine bright over us, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that um, we would not lose sight of you. We would be in your presence, trust in you, believe for you, find wisdom in your scriptures, and your word, and your spirit, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just grow within us the ability to walk in your freedom, to continue to walk in your freedom, and not lose sight of you, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts today to your truth, Lord God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Count it all joy. The command that James resonate, uh, this command that, you know, James spoke in this passage resonates to us today. Whatever might come along your path is not big enough to get in the way of God. Mm. It's not. No matter what you might think, it might be strong and mighty and disastrous, it won't destroy you. We've been talking in our men's group about giants must fall. I keep mentioning this every, almost every Sunday after. <laughs> uh, but we've been talking in our men's group that giants must fall. We're talking about the story of David and Goliath, right? And this Goliath, this beast, this massive man, gigantic, unreal, standing in front of them, yet there was no fear in David, right? He was sure and confident in God. And one of the things that we can do is we can learn to be confident in what God is doing in our life. We can trust in Him. And to do that in the best way possible, we have to live in joy. Count it all joy, right? God has already passed uh, uh, he, God has already passed us. He's already passed the, the conflict, the trial that might get there. He's already passed it. He's waiting for us to see the path that he's put before us. He's already gotten us past it. We just don't realize it yet. We haven't been, or we haven't realized it yet. We haven't gotten through it yet. But the journey of it all is something that we can live in joy and completeness in. We can find uh, perfection because we, we count it all joy. We have... We rejoice in the presence of God, knowing that these tests, this test, this trial, this perseverance, this endurance, will grow us closer to God. We'll see more of His glory revealed to us. There are two possible meanings to the trials that James describes in verse two: the inner enticement to sin, the inner desire to fulfill the flesh, brokenness that exists because of one's own selfish plan. This is what James is getting at in, in verse 14 when he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We live in the curse of sin because we are from Adam, but guess what? The curse is broken, and that is all that is required is faith in Christ. So we could be talking about that. The other thing you can talk about is the external affliction and persecution. We see in 1 Peter 4.12, 14, Beloved, do not... Surprise, be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Aren't you glad to hear that today, right? 
glory of God rests upon you. Whatever evil may try to come against you, uh, against and believe, uh, your belief and trust, it won't destroy you. If you trust and believe in God, He will pull you through and He will reveal His glory in those moments. It will transform your life. It can be either one of these both. But James is discussing here, um, it is important, either one of these or both, both of those uh, thoughts on trials. But either way, it's important to know that, I, uh, that God will pull you through. And there are transactions that James preaches about uh, here that I want, there's a transaction system here that he preaches about here that I want to kind of dive into. First off, these um, testing produces steadfastness. Testing brings along steadfastness. You can say like an arrow to steadfastness, right? The word for steadfastness is hypomone. Uh -huh. For fortitude, saying power, heroic endurance, is not meek, passive submission to circumstances, but a strong, active, challenging response in which the, uh, the satisfying realities of Christianity are proven in practice. So this quality is what Paul is describing when he wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1.4, when he you know, talks to, he's talking to the Thessalonians here, therefore we ourselves boast about you in the church of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecution and in affliction that you are enduring. So what was he doing? He's boasting, he's he excited that they were doing this thing. They were being steadfast in their faith. They were trusting it. So if we... Um, it starts off by the testing of the faith, and it leads us into steadfastness. We become more enduring and strong and mighty in the spirit. Right? It's not like physically strong, but we become more connected to what God wants, his plan, his desires, and we become more confident in that, and we can walk further in that. So now, we are, after that, we, are, uh, let, we have to let that work of steadfastness take full effect, to be perfected, to perfect itself. It's interesting uh, that this passage kind of, you know, goes along a couple other passages, Romans 3, 5, sorry, 3, Romans 5, 3 through 5, and 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. You have two other writers, Peter and Paul, writing separate things. 1 Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing this is Paul, uh, that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and has been given to us. And Peter, 1 Peter 1, 6-7, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been uh, grieved by various trials, so that the testing of so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through it is tested by fire and may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In both of these cases, we are directed to rejoice through trial so that our faith can mature. We have to mature our faith. It's like a, uh, you know, something that has to sit for a while, right? We have to to let our, our faith grow and be, uh, this is what the word steadfastness is, what he's getting at is that our faith is becoming stronger and stronger and it has to be perfect, it's perfecting itself, it's making itself complete within us, so that we can live in faith and trust in him no matter the circumstances. It's not us becoming perfect, but it's our faith being perfected, right, within us. Our, our trust in him becomes so perfected that we can rely on God in multiple situations, and it's, it opens the door for us to be uh, uh, able to, 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 to call out darkness and to walk in faith, even when it's difficult and tough and hard. We have to mature our faith, and we continue to do that over time, over time, and over time, and over time. Every little test along the way grows our faith. Every little moment where uh, we should be doubting, we should be struggling with this thing, but we continue on, and it grows our faith. It's hard to do. We have to. We, we might even consider ourselves to be naive in our thinking because we we think God. Well, I'm just going to trust you no matter what. And and, and you know everybody on the outside is like, what are you doing this, <laughs> right? Uh, but we trust in God, and we grow our faith even in those moments 
where things aren't going our way, where things are difficult. We trust him, and he gets us through. He's already, like I said, he's already passed the trial. <laughs> he's sitting there, he's like, hey, this is the path, right? This is, this is how you're going to get there. It can be either, uh, sorry, uh, um, let me skip forward. Next, we are to let this work of steadfastness take full effect, like I said. We have to let this steadfastness be perfected and become perfect itself. So that the steadfastness can perfect and become complete. And we can become complete. James is focusing on using these similar words so that we can see that God is at the center of this perfecting. Right? James states this perfecting or steadfastness leads to three of the same things. Perfection, completeness, and lacking nothing. He does something here that is uh, just, you know, cool writing for James, I would say. You know, first of all, he, he talks about the steadfastening, perfecting, right? It's, or when it says take full effect, that means perfect. Right? It's the same word that he's using next in line, right? We try to, to make it seem like it's, but it's just rep repetitive. He's being very repetitive. And then he's also going to be very repetitive with the word lack, right? He says, and lacking in nothing. He brings us to that point so that the next verse can continue on the same thought pattern, right? This perfecting of steadfastness leads us to these three things, and um, even though they're all the same, perfection, completeness, and lacking nothing, those are, he's saying the same thing over and over again. He's giving it in three different ways so that we can understand fully that this is an important thing, right? We have to be tested in our faith. We have to go through these trials. It's not going to be easy. And all of us have been through it. Each one of you guys has been through some trials, and things that was so difficult. It was breaking you down. But you continued on in your faith, and you believed, and you trusted in Him. And now you're here. There have been several moments in my life where uh, my call to ministry has become into question, and I've continued on. Like somebody came up and said, maybe you shouldn't be in ministry. Mm. Leaders. <laughs> uh, that I did not like very well, as you probably can gather. I've said those things to me. Or at least well, one of them did. Um, but along the way, these are trials and difficulties that we go through. God, he breaks us. He doesn't, he doesn't break us. He, he, he uh, makes us go through these seasons where we might be um, have trial in these situations. And you know, he's not trying to push us into sin. He's not trying to tempt us into failure. But he's but the world around us is full of sin and darkness. And as we walk, walk through our time period, if we trust in God and have faith, right? There's going to be some feedback that comes along the way. So things are going to come at us. And God's already worked out how we can conquer these things. He's already gotten us through it. Though it might seem hard and difficult for us in the moment, like I can't get out of this loop or out of this frame of mind. God's already worked it out for us. We just have to trust and believe and have faith in it. I think of, uh, you guys ever, I know you guys probably aren't into rock climbing. I'm not either. But I was <laughs> thinking, trying to think of some extreme sports um, that uh, you might consider to be a little risky, right? You might think if somebody, you see somebody climbing up the side, especially if they're free soloing, if they're climbing out without any rope, they're just they're sticking their hands in the hole, and they're just climbing up this, you know, 200 foot wall, they're just putting their hands and things and feet, climbing it up. It sounds, cra it looks crazy. <laughs> it looks like they're out of their mind, and some of them are. They're they're met, but they are measuring their risk, right? They know that these holds, to them, are pretty solid. <laughs> For us, maybe not. But to them, these holds are pretty solid. And they've gone through this path many times before they attempted free soloing, right? Or at least attempted by themselves, by themselves. They've measured out, and they may have confidence that they can do it. They might even say that it's just like climbing a ladder for them, you know, just a really long ladder. <laughs> Go straight up. If you imagine it like that, it sounds a little bit easier to climb up. 
because most of us can climb a ladder. We don't usually want to climb ladders that are much higher than like four or five feet. But <laughs> if you just take each step at a time, because they're confident that they can do these things, they just climb right up it. The same thing with other extreme sports. People are really confident. They, they know that there's risk, but they're confident in what they can control, the elements of it they can control. And so that lets them do these things, <laughs> even though it might sound crazy. It's important for us to understand that this process, this process of us being tested, gives us that kind of confidence. Not in ourselves, not in our own ability to do things, but in God. We become more confident that God is going to take us further in trusting in Him. We need not lean into trial or let it, or, or let it uh, oh, sorry, we don't want to try to go out and be risk takers like, you know, people that climb mountains and stuff like that. But those trials are going to come along the way all the time. They're going to get in our way all the time. Moments like these will cause us to, uh, to think about our faith. <laughs> right? But if we're confident, these things will give us confidence. Right? If, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we trust and have faith, we'll get confidence from it. Right? We'll be stronger all the way. We'll, not because of our own ability, like I said, but because of God. So I like to think of it like this. If we can trust in God all the way, He'll take us past anything that we might, get, might have any problems with. He grows us, makes us complete in Him. In 2, Timothy, sorry, 2 Titus 2, 2, it says, Older men are too sober-minded. This is uh, uh, what he's try Paul's trying to tell Titus to be the certain thing. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. We see this word steadfastness because it's described of God a lot, especially of his love uh, in the Old Testament. It's a different word, but... Uh, we see a, a word of steadfastness or, or continuation, uh, a description of God always being there, always being ready to go. It's kind of like faithfulness. We see that throughout the scripture a lot too, describing God. We have to live in that same sort of mindset of, I want to get to a point where I'm confident in who I am, that I can be steady and ready to go, no matter what might come our way. That's good. So, the next thing is, what you lack, God will give you. In James 1.5, if any of you, it said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. It's one of my favorite parts of this passage. He gives generously without reproach. When we think that we lack, we learn God does not, right? And now Proverbs 8.12, I'm going to read a few Proverbs here in a row, so you guys... Sit back a little bit. Proverbs 8.12, it says, uh, I, wisdom, dwell in, with prudence, I, and I find knowledge and discretion. And uh, two verses or later, it says in 8.14, I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. A little bit further down, uh, Proverbs 8.35-36, for whoever finds me, talking about wisdom here, finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. For he who fails to find me injure, uh, injures himself, and, who, and all who hate me love death. We grow our faith by growing our wisdom, so that the trials that, may take, may not, uh, that come our way may, not, may take effect, right? and may give us more confidence. Steph studies. Those trials, those testing, those testing of our faith, they'll work their process out in us so that our faith is magnified, not destroyed. Proverbs 9, 17 says, Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abused. Abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is insight for by me your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. I, I want to read that whole section because um, there's something important you, you see in there is that those that are living in wickedness, like we can't correct them, right? Mm -hmm. It just will reflect back, they'll just attack us. 
the people that we can correct are those that are already living in wisdom, right? When we give wisdom to wise people, right, they grow from it. We give wisdom to those that don't want to hear it, they're going to just be worse, right? As believers, we feel like compelled all the time to get online and, and correct people for bad behavior, people though we don't even know, and they're like friends of friends. Um, but if they're not living for God, if they're not living in Christ, if we don't have a relationship with them, more, more importantly, uh, we're, they're not going to take that wisdom from us. And many of you guys know that you have family members that you've tried to say good things to them about, about being better in this and being better in that, and it doesn't really work out that well. The key is sharing your faith, sharing your witness, your testimony to them. That's the only way they can really understand because guess what? We can't correct them, but the Spirit of God can correct them. So we call it conviction, right? It, it gets in their heart and like makes them feel... Make, you guys felt it when you guys were saved. You felt like this gooeyness, like, God, I feel like I need to go to the altar and just, just uh, a desperation to be in God's presence. I guess a gooeyness is not a good word for it. <laughs> uh, a desperation to be in God's presence. And we, uh, we depend on the Holy Spirit to do that. But we can't if we try to correct those that are in wickedness and in darkness, they're not going to take it very well. I, I love this idea is that if we're living in faith, wisdom can only magnify that faith. It can only make us stronger and readier for the process. But if we're living in darkness, wisdom is completely lost to us. It's completely out of our understanding. So, as believers, we should trust and believe, be willing to listen to wisdom. Even if it comes from weird uh, places, people that are being inappropriate, uh, we need to take on some understanding uh, of what they're trying to say. And hopefully that God is speaking to us in some other way, not just in somebody coming after us, right? Let God speak to you no matter the circumstance. Let them walk, walk in freedom with that wisdom that comes from Scripture, that comes from God. Let it be encouraging to you. Let your faith grow. So, if we look at wisdom, it's something that grows our faith. That's why I like the connection in this passage, because he is saying that you'll lack nothing because of the testing, and then he talks about wisdom. So this must have been something that was needed at the time. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, James is probably one of, it's like, maybe Galatians, and then James, I think, or the earliest books written in the New Testament. So this is written before the Gospels. <laughs> before any of We're talking about a James, the brother of Jesus Christ, not James the disciple. These are probably dead by this point, a martyr. But James, the brother of Jesus Christ, had become somebody prominent in the, in the Jewish culture. So you see a lot of uh, the Jewish Christians, he, he, he had, they all knew who he was, right? That's why he just said, I'm James. <laughs> he didn't bother to say, hey, I'm James from so-and-so, from so-and-so. He didn't give all that heritage. They knew who he was. But he's doing something here. He must be teaching something to the general church at the time about seeking after wisdom. There's, um, when our faith grows, it grows to become wiser. Like, things come to us that we didn't know that we knew. <laughs> like, we can memorize Scripture, but sometimes memorizing Scripture doesn't really resonate in our hearts. So like, we, it can't, but I'm not saying that's a bad idea. <laughs> Keep doing that, please. <laughs> um, but, um, the, the wisdom of God really highlights the passages in our mind, and we're able to apply that in moments that we didn't know about, because the Spirit of God guided us through the process, and that wisdom came into our mind. It wasn't just information. It was wisdom. It was a, a ability to apply things in certain moments. There's a difference between those things, because we can have all the information, but miss out on what God wants us to do. If we live in wisdom, we can trust in Him, and He's going to take us further along in our ministry. Our faith is going to grow. When you are aware of God, you can lack nothing, right? God is enough to cover our weakness and be our strength. In our moment of trial, we can rejoice because we have wisdom to know that God will pull us through. 
This takes us continually learning. With every season of hardship, we carry more strength than God. In Ecclesiastes 1.15, it says, What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. See the parallel there. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. We have a wisdom passage talking about what is lacking cannot be counted. So if you're going to count it all joy, <laughs> if you're going to walk in freedom, your faith has to grow, right? I love that connection there. So we are counting it all joy. That means we must not be lacking. In a sense, wisdom plays an important role in our maturity to rejoice within suffering. Wisdom takes a, a, a priority in our maturity to be able to rejoice in suffering. Because instead of looking at the thing that's right in front of us, we rely on what God has taught us through all the other trials, through all the other testing. We rely and we know that God is, is doing something within all of us and that wisdom gives us strength to rejoice. So if we can't count on it, all joy, because we're lacking, right? You can't count on it. Uh, let's look at this. God has invested in us having this gift of wisdom, not reprimanding us for our failures. Of the past, we are made complete. Sorry, I read that weird. Uh, God has invested in us having this gift of wisdom. He's not reprimanding us for our failures of the past, and we are made complete. So you get that? We're made complete. He's not going to tell us... He's not going to come after us for all the bad stuff that we did, uh, right? For trusting in him, he's going to bring us back into joy, bring us back into his presence, because that's what grace is. It's, it's more than we can even think about. He has so much of it because it all comes from him. Uh, the word generously in this passage, uh, I highlighted it. It means single or singly or singly, right? Uh, God zeroes in on each desire that um, we have towards wisdom, each thought that we might be uh, able to grow from. He zeroes in on us and he gives us wisdom right, for the situation. He put it as, as generously, but the word really means single. And I'm going to get back to that. In James 1, 6, 7 it says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, uh, sorry, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So the word that we're talking about God giving wisdom is generously or singly to us. He focuses in sing, you know, singularly, right? It's a... It's a uh, it goes kind of against what he's talking about, the ones that doesn't walk in wisdom, right? The ones that doubts, the ones that walks away, uh, that doubts and is in trouble here is double-minded. I would like to make you guys understand that he's using single and double there. <laughs> it's double-minded. So, it's the negative of it all, is double-minded person. We're not just thinking about God, we're thinking about we're focusing our life on the world as well. We have to focus in on God in a singular way, right? We have to uh, not ignore the world around us, but realize that our doubt is the negative of faith. It is often the trials that will make us question our resolve. But fear not and let God be God. In Matthew eleven twenty two through 23 it says, and Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. You see how that passage is like kind of the opposite of our passage there, six verses 6 and 7. See, he's saying that have faith in God. Truly I say to you, this mountain will move. There's a parallel or a, a, a going in these passages is that, you know, this is a passage from Jesus in Matthew. Again, 
James has written before these Gospels, but these are references, there's things that, sayings of Christ that were being passed around, um, not collected yet, but they were being passed around. James is relying on this, and he says, faith gives God control of our situation, basically. Doubt subjects us to the elements of things around us. Do you get that? Faith gives, us, gives God control of our situation, Right? Doubt subjects us to the elements around us. So in our passage, the one that doubts, right, is like a wave at the sea, is driven and tossed by the wind. But when we have faith, we can say to the mountain, move, and be taken and thrown into the sea. You see those similarities there, right? James is teaching us something that... They had already been learning through Christ, but you know they hadn't put it all together in this passage yet, but he's pointing to it right there as a message of faith is something... Uh, he's teaching the same message that, that Christ is teaching us. That faith gives us control of our situation. Or it gives God control of our situation. We, we, we think that... Um, I want to say this really carefully because um, it's not that God has, doesn't have control of our situation all the time. But we can get ourselves underneath God's presence and, and, and try to go against what his plans are, right? When we don't have faith. We get locked outside of his plans because of our own selfish desires, right? So when we have faith, we, allow, we, we say, God, have control of our situation. And all of a sudden, everything around us, even the elements, the mountains will move, yeah. the water will be <laughs> thrown into the sea, right? That's good. Yeah. Instead of us being tossed around and driven into, <laughs> by the winds of the sea. Mm -hmm. You guys got, kind of get that? Okay. The last thing I want to talk about, and I know it's late, we've had a lot today. I'm sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the rich... Fade away. The rich fade away. And James 1, 9 through 11 says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, and withers the grass. Its flowers falls. Its flower falls. And its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. The boasting is not the arrogant... Uh, uh, this boasting that he's talking about is not an arrogant pride, but a boasting in God's values. It's boasting in the things and the values that God sees valuable. Right? I like to think that James is uh, sourcing the story of the rich young man, um, even though, like I said, it would not be, you know, Mark hadn't put it together yet, but <laughs> we're going to read out of Mark 10, 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. This is what he's telling the rich young man. You lack one thing. There's that word lack again, right? Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Wealth can inhibit us from following God's provision. We're not going to lack if we have faith, right? So, if we continue in that, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have any problems, right? Mm -hmm. But what Jesus is saying in this passage in Mark, and also it's also in Matthew, uh, is you lack one thing. You have to give up your wealth. It's hard for us to give away our comfort, our wealth. That's what we talked about again in Giants Must Fall this week for a men's group. So come next time. <laughs> uh, we talk about comfort must fall. But we, we, we carry all this wealth and all these, these material things around us. That's Americanism, right? <laughs> we have tons of things uh, that make us feel like we, we can do, we can live our life. Right? We have schedule electronics and, and, and uh, we have the perfect uh, sound system in our car that can give us map and guidance. And all these things are comfortable things for us. And they're all things that we don't really need, but in our society now you need them. <laughs> But we can't store up these things all the time. We have to be willing to let them go because guess what? Wealth doesn't go with us to heaven. And it can inhibit us from realizing God's provision. 
If we trust more in the things that we have, we lack trust in God. Right? We can overvalue our wealth and lose sight of the miracle provision that God has cast for us. In Matthew 5, 3, um, and then we're going to read 10 through 12. It said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we're skipping to verse 10. Matthew 5. This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and other all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice, rejoice, and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, we see that rejoice in the middle of persecution. It's a common theme, right? Mm -hmm. And Christ was telling us about it at this point in time. Wildflowers, you know, they only have a short period of time, right? I mean, the blue bonnets come like March, April, uh, one of the, the, the Indian paintbrushes and the uh, one of the other oh, wildflowers. But they come for a season and they're gone, right? Mm -hmm. right. Another season comes and they come back. That's the way wealth is described in this passage is that wealth is there only seasonal, right? There'll be times when you live in great abundance and have a, a, a job that's providing you to do all sorts of things, go on all sorts of trips, but you can't live in that space all the time. It has this beginning and end. It's got a cycle to it. I know that all of us, I know that I for sure, had that one job where I was making all this money. I wasn't like making a ton of money, but I had a job where I was making a lot of money, but it was getting in the way of my calling in the ministry. I was working at churches full, like part-time, but I needed to be full-time. I needed to step out in faith. And all of us have had jobs that, you know, got in the way of our lives, right? They, they paid really well, and they were really great for a season because we were having all this stuff, but it got us out of focus on our lifestyle and our, our family and our, our, the people around us, our friendships. We, um, it's, it's important for us to realize that wealth, we have to work hard. We have to be willing to, to be good stewards of what God gives to us. But it can inhibit us, like I said. It can take us away from seeking out God's provision, for God's wisdom. We look to the wisdom of the financial situation or the material things and not the wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of God. And we can... Um, it's important for us not to focus in on our finances all the time. And I remember a few weeks ago, we were in our prayer on Sunday. It was like, I think it was almost a month ago now. I was praying. I was like, God, I want to see more financial freedom in this church. Mm -hmm. And the financial freedom comes, though, when we really give things to God. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Like, you would think that we, um, our, when our, our giving is, is, is less, we can save more <laughs> than survive. But it works the opposite. We have to continue to give to God and give over to God because guess what? And not because we are going to get blessed, but because God provides for us. He's always providing for us. And if He's not providing for us, then we're not giving enough. We're not really, uh, we're holding on to things too much. Trusting in God is not easy. We can't seek comfort in building up our wealth and safety. But having faith takes us um, uh, takes us out of that type of thinking. We continue to trust in God more than our wealth, then we're going to continue to see His provision. And the things that we are lacking, God is going to help us get through. We're not going to live like super wealthy lifestyles, uh, only like the super rich, uh, famous pastor that teaches at that one uh, church that is like, you know, 500,000 people. Yeah. I don't know. Um, only those people can be wealthy. <laughs> yeah. you know, God. But they have to probably check themselves quite a bit. <laughs> because it's very dangerous. Yes. Even pastors, I remember when I was, um, when I was a kid, we, we 
we're serving in Argentina. This is one of my last stories. I'm, I'm promised. We're almost done. <laughs> I'm really late. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, when I was a teen, when I was a little kid, we were in Argentina, and there was this evangelist that had uh, was having this great revival. God was doing these great things. His name was Claudio Freitas, and you've probably heard of him. Um, but if you don't know, uh, he was pastoring this big church. It's probably like a thousand people in Argentina, and. God told him to, to quit the job and go start preaching in the streets. So he, he stopped being the pastor of this church and started ministering in this neighborhood. Just would go out there and pray and preach for months. I, it was like a long time. <laughs> and, um, but that ended up being the next step in his faith growth. Because he was willing to sacrifice the position, all of a sudden he was pushed to this next layer of uh, closeness to God. We want are so desperately to build ourselves up to comfortability, to be like, I figured out God, it's, this is where I'm going to be, I'm happy now. But testing and trial is really something that's important for our faith. If we're going to go through, um, if we're going to grow and become more mature and more, lack nothing and be uh, found complete in Him and trusting in Him and His righteousness and His goodness, then we're going to have to go through testing. And that's going to build our confidence. It's going to make us steadfast, right? And um, that takes us stepping out of our, our time of trial, stepping out of our uh, room of comfort and being willing to trust in God completely. Giving away, like the rich young man had to give away the, the, all that he had to the poor, that was not a fun thing for him, so he just walked right away. He's like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I did all the other good things, but I can't give away what's mine. But none of it is, belongs to us. We can trust in God. We can trust in God completely. We realize that everything belongs to God, and we can live in faith and know that He's going to provide for us. What is lacking, He will complete. But though, in 1 Timothy 6, 9-10, it says, For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. You guys know that one. Mm -hmm. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the path and pierced themselves with many things. My hope is that God speaks to us in the end the way that Paul speaks to Timothy in, in uh, Psalms, or sorry, in 2 Timothy Psalms, 2 Timothy 3.10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Don't we want to live a life that somebody would say something like that to us, especially from God? No. You have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. I want to pray that over you today. Um, God is calling us to a deeper faith in Him. And I know that each one of you guys has gone through something this week that is, has made it difficult to trust in Him. Because, guess what? That's what life is about. We have things that come along the way that try to disturb our comfort uh, and, 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 and stir up our faith. So I want to pray, and if you feel like you need to come down to the altar, we're going to pray for you down here. Um, but I want to pray over everybody. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Well, God, I pray right now Lord, that you would just help us to see the bigger picture, to realize that no matter the trial, no matter the struggle, we can count it all joy. And know, Lord God, that we can grow from those seasons of trial, those seasons of testing, that you will give us, make us more confident in who you are, that we won't lose sight of you. Lord God, I pray right now that you would just correct our hearts to not to not completely lose track of your presence, to not be double-minded, to not try to consider the darkness 
and the goodness and, and try to figure it out for ourselves, but to trust in you completely. To know, Lord God, that you're doing good things for us because we've seen it already. I pray, Lord God, that you would just transform our minds into being more and more like you. That whatever we do, whatever um, trial or situation we might go through, Lord God, that we will be wise enough, we will lack nothing, we will be confident in who you are, and be steadfast, be patient and kind and loving and careful in those moments to walk in your favor, to walk in your trust. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would take away, melt away all our desire for selfish pride, all our desire for wealth and comfort, and help us to really seek out the comfort of knowing you, my God, the, the value of knowing you, the things that you value, so that no matter the circumstances, nothing will get in our way. Lord, guide us in our pursuit of you. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll open the altar for a little bit, and we'll play a little bit of uh, worship music. Um, but I just want to open it up for those that um, need prayer. So we're going to, I want you guys to just stick with us for a couple more minutes and uh, pray with us. Uh, and anybody, if anybody 